Good morning. Good morning. Hi, I'm Del. So um, I like to think myself a little bit more like the warm-up act. So like it's the beginning of the concert and I'm the warm-up act, okay? So let's start. <clears throat> An idea is born, steel is struck, history is melted and the conversation is so hot. That's how I thought I'd start. So a blacksmith. So I think sometimes there's a lot of conversation around names and terms and I'm not having that conversation this morning. I'm talking about other things. So I'm just going to say a blacksmith, a person that forges hot metal. So to start off with, to give some context, I think it's important that we know where we started in order to know where we're going next. So what did a blacksmith do throughout history? This would not have been a question the blacksmith had an obvious role in every community. From the father of technology to the village smith, they often worked to commission and in response to a local demand. Skills-based knowledge was largely tacit and highly localised, and they clearly knew what their work was. They made a great diversity of products, tools, household items, locks, chains. They undertook repair work and even did horseshoes sometimes. There was a need for these products, blacksmiths had their market, and maybe it was simpler. What does a blacksmith do now, and what will we do next? What's the future? What is our utopia? What is the role? I'm delighted to be here with you to discuss this. Let's take a moment to see what it is now and where we are. As a discipline, it's fragmented, expanding and elastic. Let's start off with a few stereotypes. <laughs> so my students are very interested in this sometimes. So um, Skyrim and all of those places where you can pretend to be a blacksmith. And sometimes they come for interviews as well and you know that's all they've done. Yeah, we're moving on. <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> sure. very <laughs> clicking <laughs> All right, no, no, I'm not going that far. <laughs> At one end, we have some blacksmiths that have established a coexistence as entertainers. Undoubtedly, forging of hot metal is a spectacle. The blacksmith was, and still is, a desired protagonist at a medieval and Christmas market. Here, forging often becomes more interesting than the result of the forging. It's one of the strongest growing markets for blacksmiths, whether in the flesh or online. Whilst others have diversi diversified, embraced new metal technologies and digital fabrication, with that comes the ability to accelerate production time, be competitive in the market, and it also brings broader choices and potentially a closer fit with modern architecture. Still today, the most prevalent discourse, the conversations that I hear the most, and that are articulated through blacksmith magazines and events are all around material and process, technique, where to buy equipment, the size of each other's power hammers, how to make it, and process conversations. Conversations around technique, and these displace conversations around concept and design and a really meaningful discourse. This must change. The very strength of traditional blacksmithing practice and its persistent cultural, rural and cult, the, 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 cultural tradition of rural nostalgia has hindered blacksmithing from gaining wider recognition as a contemporary art form. This extraordinary discipline must move beyond the dichotomy of tradition and process and embrace concept and ideas as a further driver. We must simply not be service providers, but commentators, makers, designers, and visual artists. But wait, there is hope. There is another group, and many of you are part of it. This is the group that I'm going to focus on in my talk. We'll call them artists, blacksmiths, we'll call them forge metal designers, and I know there's a new cool word in Germany called, what do you call them in Germany? See? So every country has a different word. 
And I believe that in recent years, the practice of artist blacksmiths has transformed. Contemporary artist blacksmiths are creating original and cohesive bodies of work which engage not only with the practices of traditional blacksmithing, with its focus on material, process and function, but also with many broader cultural, environmental and socio-political conversations. The works they bring create a fresh perspective on the discipline and demand new critical consideration, giving focus to an international community of artists blacksmiths driven by ideas and concept as much as by material and process. It's a really exciting time. The conceptual territory of the discipline is evolving. The future has few obstacles except the perceptions derived from its historical formats. The material itself poses no limitations in its ability to be applied creatively to our environment. The limitation is only in our perception of the possibilities of iron. The Forge exhibition hosted here in the Ferrum House was curated by myself and was inspired by a series of conversations as to how I could increase the visibility of innovative contemporary forged metal. Opening at Rithin Craft Centre, its focus was on objects for a gallery context. The exhibition showcases a breadth of practice from forge vessels to architectural ironwork and sculpture, but it was very much for a gallery. For me, Forge, the exhibition, represents a paradigm shift breaking new ground by synthesising and articulating the practice of creative and conceptual working with forged metal. The selected exhibitors represent a new wave of artists, blacksmiths and forged metal designers who have developed an innovative practice. And the exhibition aims to make clear that creative and conceptual working with forged metal is an emerging, innovative and international discipline. For all of the exhibitors, the manipulation of forged metal is central and demonstrates an awareness that goes beyond process. The sculptural objects and vessels and architectural works are distinctive in every aspect of their construction. They are designed. Here, material knowledge and the craft is applied in new and exciting ways to merge concept, process, and material. This is from one of the reviews um, from Roger Conan. Um, Forge is a cultural slider. The exhibition breathes new life into old vessels. Many of the contributors selected demonstrate a practice transformed through teaching and the necessity for academic and industrial research. The ambiguities in these works of metal are as clear as they need to be. Open to anyone with an interest in the anvil, where will scholarship begin locating this practice and what will define, even validate its specificity? Right now, I've used the word practice and um, it's something that I really want to spend a bit of time looking at and what do I mean when I say practice? And so I've used this example of my colleague Ambrose Byrne. You can recognise an artwork made by Ambrose, whether it's architectural or sculptural. There are themes and ideas that he consistently explores and ways that he moves and manipulates the material, the forged details that are repeated again and again in his works. Ambrose looks directly and freshly into the natural world to define his own forms. He draws on growth and movement. He looks at fractals, at plants and shells. He analyzes their shapes, their rhythms, their patterns. He finds lines as the starting point for a design. And he explores how a material as hard, as heavy as steel, can express velocity, vitality, resulting in works which are rich both in historic references and in contemporary design values. 
There is a consistency and a clarity in his intention. Ambrose has a voice. He has a practice. He has defined the conceptual territory and processes, and he articulates that both in everything that he does and also about what he writes about his work. Let's take another example from downstairs, Stephen Yusko. In his extraordinary, finely crafted objects, he explores the ideas of home by using salvaged material with its own layers of meaning. He extrapolates and redefines details, providing a counterpoint between what the object was and what it has become. I love the lids. Um, the lids on the tops of the boxes really capture something of plasticity, plasticity and the real sort of essence of forging with those punched holes. They're absolutely delicious. I love the lids. Um, the gentle fit of that lid conveys a feeling of warmth and caress. Whilst Richard Smith's work evoked the uncompromising geometry of architectural shapes, allied to plastic forms and the colour of geological strata, light plays off the surface of metal, which has been moved through many hours of painstaking repoussé, a time-honoured process to produce innovative and a very personal outcome. Again, he has a practice, he has a voice. These complex comp compositions offer a solemnity and presence as the viewer explores the reflective quality of meticulously textured facets, contours and forms. These, all of these exhibitors have a practice that is clearly and confidently communicated they're all driven by ideas and concept as much as by process and material. Right, now, my job is to teach the next generation to ensure they develop a clear voice and that they have a practice through making the work that touches, moves and inspires them, that has real integrity to it. They understand what their role is in society, and they can articulate this through what they're making in forged steel and also in the way they speak about their work and the way they write about their work. As you all know, I have the privilege to lead the only degree programme in the UK focusing on creative and conceptual working with hot forged metal. It's art school for blacksmiths. The emphasis is placed on fostering creativity and we look at both conceptual, technical and material understandings. We definitely have one leg firmly in the craft and we really believe in material knowledge and learning how to forge. But students are encouraged to view technical skills as a means to a creative end rather than an end to themselves. And experimentation is absolutely critical. We challenge material and we work towards people having a real creative voice and a real integrity in what they do. So processes, skills and technique are combined with ideas, concepts, good solid research and, and designs are developed. We are creative and experimental and we are very passionate about the journey of how practice develops. I thought I'd spend a few minutes telling you about how we teach because I think it's a model that can work for students but also for professionals and it reminds us of that journey of creative practice. So, I have these little drawings. I think that um, in my pedagogy and my own research it's become really important that I get much more explicit about the creative process and really um, make it transparent. So I think that to make an object or an artifact, you have to have conversations around ideas, materials, and process. And the arrows are drawn in such a way that sometimes you start off with a strong idea, sometimes you start off with some really intuitive work in the forge, so your process can come first, but always there is a conversation around ideas, process and material. 
it's not rocket science, but it's really important to remember. Okay, so this is how I teach my students. Okay, so I break down the creative process and I say, at the beginning, you have to be really clear about your ideas and your concept. Um, you need to test possibilities and then you need to refine your body of work. And there are these bullet points to keep everyone on track, to remember how important each stage of the journey is. Um, so, at the beginning, it's important that there's lots of primary and secondary source material, that people use words, that they're clear about their intention. I talk a lot about clarity of intention, and I think it's something we all need to remember to do. I think that one of the things that when you're a student is you're able to give yourself permission for testing possibilities and exploring and experimenting. I put a whole stage here in, um, to really emphasise the importance of that. And when I talk to my graduates and when I talk to professionals, it's one of the hardest things to keep going in your own practice and your own career. I was talking to um, Shona Johnson from Ratho Byers and she started now her Friday morning play session. You know, it's so important to give yourself time to test possibilities, to extend your vocabulary of materials, and to really explore form and shape, um, explore through drawing and also through material, and to give yourself permission to do that. And clearly, outcomes are critical too. So how do we do this with students? Well, we try to be really explicit about where ideas come from. So, as we all know, often through personal research, set briefs, narratives, I think you all know this list. Um, I try and encourage a lot of my students to be involved in an ethical and socially engaged practice. Um, often ideas can come from the beginning of material and process, or looking at traditional practice within the vernacular, or being really focused on function and product. And more often than not, it comes from a combination of all of those things because we're very eclectic in the way that we design. So um, in art school and in Hereford, we often begin with generating personal research. And I have this exercise around images and words. And um, I've um, also, in my other teaching classes of the design process, I think it's a really good thing for everyone to get into the habit of doing. So collect those key images. Um, that really inspire your practice. Pin them up on the wall. I have a particular aversion to sketchbooks uh, because it seems to me that every time you turn a page, the information is lost. So um, I'm really obsessive about my students putting things on walls, inhabiting spaces fully. Um, really analyse the connections between the groups of things that you found and always it's important to use words to um, articulate what it is you're trying to communicate. And this is what my world looks like. Um, students have individual workspaces, um, they have um, primary source material and from the real world work that other people have made, secondary source material, they're drawing, they're collecting, they're being reflected and recording things. Being a reflective practitioner is very important. It's the only way you can improve is if we analyse and know where we're going next. So we teach them mechanisms about how to be reflective as well. It's interesting when you ask them to find connections between their objects. Sometimes they take the images down and look at them and regroup them and put them back up again or change the groups. Other times, they have really complicated, they have different coloured strings that connect different themes and ideas around what they're doing. Sometimes we have sticky labels and stickers and post-it notes and all sorts of things. It's really important to interrogate, re-interrogate, analyse and reanalyse. Sometimes now, much more of that is happening digitally, which is great. And so a lot of my students will have um, blogs or online presence. Um, but they always need to look at real objects as well. We talk about object-based analysis, how to interrogate objects, looking at people like Rose and Prang to understand about how to really decipher and interrogate objects, their meaning and their value. So that's the sort of academic underpinning of some of the research we encourage our students to do. 
So alongside that learning, they're learning the craft, they're learning about engineering tolerances, they're forging their own tongs. Um, for me, our students sometimes come from an art and design background where they have very little forge skill. Sometimes they come and they're blacksmiths and they have done less drawing classes and sometimes they're ex-engineers or just explorers that have discovered hot metal. So the next stage is around testing possibilities and really um, having got that fixed point, exploring how to develop designs, testing, exploring equivalents and um, really, really, really building up that vocabulary. I often say to my students they've been talking for such a long time in life but they have been forging a lot less. You really need to practice those words, practice those vocabulary, get better at talking and understanding your material through testing and testing and testing. Whether it's looking at whole shapes or edge qualities, whether it's looking at components. And this is my favourite drawing. <laughs> Because wherever you are, and lots of people have talked this morning about their own new directions, wherever you are in the creative process, from identifying ideas, testing, or finishing outcomes, there is a constant amount of choosing and selecting you can do. From any one point you are, the possibilities of where you could take your work and your practice into a different direction are endless. Always there's lots of choices, lots of possibilities. Sometimes that can become utterly overwhelming, but it is what is most exciting and it's what really fires your practice on. And um, so we talk a lot about the possibilities of where to go next. In the end, we want students to choose things that really touch, move and inspire them. I want students that have, whose work they have a voice um, and I think the best way to get them to get out of bed and work in the morning is if they're doing something they love. So um, you need to challenge yourself, but you need to uh, make work that really inspires you. So, um, and then obviously when it comes to the final outcome, it's important to think about the viewer interaction, the audience, the market, the demographic, the pricing. All of those things we teach students, we do business plans, we have an online presence. But what is it that they make? So I've got a few examples of the sort of work that we're doing with our students to give you a sense of, um, of the vision for the shift that I'm practicing because I do have a really exciting job where I've got the next generation coming through and talking to me all the time. We've got, uh, we have over nearly 60 undergraduate students in artist blacksmithing and they come from all over the world. It's great fun. So I have students from America, from Germany, I have none from the Czech Republic. I have some, lots of students from Norway um, and um, from Australia, from New Zealand, from South Africa and I have my first student from Hong Kong this year which is really exciting. Um, so he sent me some amazing photographs when he came for his interview. There was nowhere to forge and he found a disused flat at one end of Hong Kong that he was forging in, which was fine until the police came and he was arrested. He's a really interesting guy, he's really passionate about the craft and has a degree in physics which makes him particularly mathematically focused. Okay, so this is a, a Sam's a bench, Sam graduated a few years ago and uh, is now working up with Chris Top as well as developing his own practice. So um, I encourage the students to make a, a real breadth of work. Um, they have such different ideas, they follow such different paths, but the one thing we have in common is our focus on um, hot forged metal and forging. So we have students that are making architectural work. Um, this student here is very driven by ideas around value and some of um, some really uh, and contemporary theory in his work that he's just beginning to explore and he's just joined our MA programme. Um, this is um, Lejek Shikon um, who's got some work downstairs and so the work that he has downstairs is some work that he did for the transition exhibition in Ypres which is around um, reforging tools, reforging sorry shells into tools. Um, and when he was a student with us, he did a bit, another interesting project. 
Um, his brother is a monk and um, has spent a lot of time in Aleppo in Syria where an improvised IED blew up the school that he was working in. And um, the, um, the Malio brothers, which are a Polish reggae band, they, um, they wanted to do something like sort of band-aid in Poland. So let, he brought back this, um, this piece of improvised IED and Leszek reforged it into a cross. And the cross became the center of the CD. And also um, little bits of metal were forged into little crosses and cast. And um, this project had raised over £100,000 in two weeks for rebuild the new school in Aleppo and carries on. So one of the things I really want my students involved in is socially engaged practice where um, working with hot iron can really make a difference. And it was great last week we had a masterclass with Alfred Bullenman who was talking about the peace nails and the work that he's doing in terms of, you know, the real sort of like community of practice that we have in blacksmithing, which is extraordinary and unlike any other discipline I've ever worked at. Right, Jacob Haggerty. Um, sometimes they're objects for interior spaces or students are very product focused. Um, this was a, a student who's very socially engaged as well. This is he makes objects for memorials, so he works with families who, um, who, who've lost someone and makes objects in response to that. So this is the work that I'm at. The result is graduates who are able to articulate their ideas and their key themes that they explore in their work and their intentions are clear and that they have a practice. And that when you look up online and you see their web presence, you see their online presence, you can see a thread, a theme, a continuity, a clarity in the work that they produce. So um, I couldn't sit up here and talk about the future without talking about 3D printing and my own take on that. And so um, here we've got some examples of some objects that have been um, 3D printed. And this is what my take is. So um, I talk to my students all about the importance of their toolbox. More than any other discipline, hot forged metal, your toolbox is really, really important, isn't it? Otherwise you get burnt, you know, it's that critical. You know, it was great. When I worked with clay, my hands were just fine. I didn't need anything else. My hands did the job. But your toolbox when you work with hot metal is absolutely critical. So. Everyone gets that. Everyone that works with metal knows about the importance of their toolbox. This is the other toolbox. This are the practice-based research methodologies that are in your design toolbox, which is as important as your other toolbox, I tell them all the time. And so in their design toolbox, they've got lots of access to drawing, just as good as the bolt tongs. Observed, technical and investigative. In terms of material and process, um, lots of practice-based research around samples, models, and maquettes. Obviously, recording those for a technical journal, so you can do it again. Um, being reflective, I could talk about that all weekend, but um, I won't. Um, so being reflective is critical because we have to be reflective to know what we're doing next. Without reflection, you can't move forward. <laughs> And without clarity of intention, you don't even know where you're going. So um, you, clarity of intention is so important. Um, so your practice is transformed when you articulate and critically reflect about the work that you have made. So um, practice important to me, clarity, reflection, all key. And our toolbox is expanding. And that's where I see 3D printing. I see it as a really, really useful tool in the toolbox that we can use and we can access. Yes, there will be some people that use it um, for whole outcomes, but for us and for my students and for the future of the discipline, I think it's a really cool tool. So um, we have 3D printers in college, they're very small. We don't do any 3D metal printing. Although I did have a great conversation with an aeronautical engineer on the flight over yesterday who, um, who's offered me to go and see his very posh sintering machines. So I'm quite excited about that. But uh, at the moment, um, we use a 3D printer.
computer, uh, working with maquettes and model making and design. Students use it to 3D print and test possibilities. You know, if we're measuring up a staircase or a site specific thing, you know, we'll 3D print that. All the students use CAD, they understand how to use CAD. Um, it's an and, it's not an or. We have two foot in material culture and the craft, and this is an and, an extra tool, an extra thing at our disposal. It's a little maquette um, from one of the students. And um, for those of you that follow um, Hereford Anvils on Instagram, will have seen um, a lot of this project. Um, so I've just had a big festival in Hereford, and um, Ambrose, my colleague, made this seating bench here for the hospice. And um, the idea is there's an area in the hospice where people can go and reflect. And so this is all beautifully forged. And the idea of the ginkgo leaf, the idea of memory, of sort of like persistence that is so symbolic with ginkgo leaves, that the whole of the top of this was covered by ginkgo leaves. I had 50 students working with me, all in very yellow t-shirts, and uh, we worked with members of the public. So we laser cut out all of the leaves, and then members of the public could come and forge one to go on the top. And it was only because we were working smart, we were working with things like the laser cutter, that we were able to work with the public in this way for half hour slots. So it was a really exciting project. Um, and it's, a, it's an example of how we can move forward and work smart. So, to conclude, the creative and conceptual working with forged metal is an emerging, innovative and international discipline. An idea is born, steel is struck, history is melted, and the conversation is hot. So my message, build a practice.